Hi there, welcome to my videos on elementary differential equations. This is the second video for chapter 9, where the topic is partial differential equations. After the brief introduction to the topic, in this video we study a specific equation, that is the heat equation, in one space dimension. Now the equation is u sub t equals c squared uxx. The reason we write c square here is to ensure that this number is positive. And this equation is defined on the interval from 0 to 1 and uh, is given for t bigger than 0. So the meaning of the unknown u here in this equation would be the temperature of a, a one space dimension object of length L, then you can think you have a, a rod with length L. Now we see that this is an equation involve derivatives both in T and in X. Now let's first assign boundary conditions at the two end of this one dimensional space. So when um, X equals zero, and we set the temperature to be zero, and uh, when x equals um, L, we set the temperature equals 0. And this holds for all t bigger than 0. The physical meaning of this condition would be that um, the temperature at the two end of this rod will be fixed. Right now, this is fixed to be 0. Furthermore, we also have an initial condition that is when t equals 0, u as a function of x, and let's call this f of x, and this is valid on the interval from 0 to L for x. So the meaning of uh, this condition would be at t equals 0, we have some initial temperature distribution on the interval from 0 to L, which can be described by this function f. So in this video, we will derive a general solution for this equation using the method called separation of variables. It's a um, more general method and can be used for many other equations. So let's um, talk about this in general. So let now u as a function of xt be the solution of some PDE, which is in one space dimension and time dependent and with suitable boundary and initial conditions. And now we seek solutions of a specific form as follows. So u as a function of xt can be written as a product of two functions, f and g, in the special form that f is only a function of x and it doesn't depend on t, and g is only a function of t and it doesn't depend on x. So if a function u um, is a product of two functions in this way, then the partial derivatives um, actually reduces to ordinary derivatives. So u sub x would be differentiating only the function in x, so we'll get f prime and gt is unchanged. And if you differentiate x twice, you just need to differentiate f twice that this is an ordinary second order derivative. Okay. And the same thing happens to the t derivative. Partial differentiation in t of u will result in just a ordinary derivative in g here, and then second derivative will just have a second derivative here. And furthermore, if you have mixed derivative, let's say you have u um, partial differential derivative in x and then in t, and that will result in, if uh, the x derivative would result in f prime and the t derivative will result in g prime. Okay, so you get the idea. And then we will put um, these uh, um, expressions using f and g back into the equation and we will try to separate the functions depending on x and g separately on different sides of the equation. Okay, so we'll take the 1D heat equation as an example. 
Okay, to solve the heat equation by separation of variables um, takes um, quite a few steps. Um, it's a lengthy derivation and we'll go through it in this video. Therefore, this video might be a little bit long. Okay, so we have, we seek solution of this form, product of f and g, and then we write out the partial derivatives, t results in g prime xx results in f double prime. And now we put these into the heat equation. That is ut equals c squared uxx. So that will be ut and then c squared, and that's uxx. So we see that the left hand side is a product of two functions, and the right hand side is also a product of two functions times a constant. And then the next step is to separate the x and t. So we see that. Um, we could uh, divide both sides by f and then move this f down here. And then we can divide both sides by c squared g and move that down there on the left. And then this is what we will get. So on the left hand side, we have g prime over c squared g, which is a function of t. And then on the right hand side, we have f double prime over f, which is a function of x. So we successfully separated the variables. Everything depend on t is on the left hand side and everything depend on x is on the right hand side. And now here comes the most important argument in the derivation. So this equation here holds for any values of x and t. So for all x and for all t, this holds. So what does it mean? That means the value of this both left hand side and right hand side does not depend on x and does not depend on t. So it doesn't depend on the independent variables in this uh, model. Therefore, it must be a constant. Okay, so now we put that, we observe that it must equal to a constant. And let's denote the constant, we call it negative p. Well, you can just call it p and then you will eventually conclude that this constant has to be negative. So let's already put it negative p here. So this means that we have now two separate ODEs, one for g and one for f. So for f, we have f double prime over f equal negative p, which can be written as this, f double prime plus pf equals zero. And for g, a similar thing, you will have g prime over c squared g is negative p, which can be written as g prime plus c squared p g equals zero. So for f, we have a second order linear ODE, and for g, we have a first order ODE. Okay, so here comes the second step of the derivation. So in this step, we will solve the first equation for f. So we remember we have um, um, f double prime plus pf equals zero. Okay, and then we know that the equation comes with boundary conditions and which eventually will give us some constraint on the function f. So let's write it down. The boundary condition u zero t, which in our expression becomes f zero, times g of t equals zero, and then ult will be f of l times g of t equals zero. And then these two equations, each of them holds for all values of t. So what can we conclude about f at zero and f at l? That's the boundary condition for f. Well, so here goes a similar argument. Look at this condition. If this shall hold for any g of t, then we can divide both sides by g of t, and then we'll get f0 must equal 0. And then the same argument goes here. If we divide both sides by g of t, then we'll have fl equals 0. OK, so um, therefore, um, if we are seeking non-trivial solution, that is g of t is not identically zero, then we conclude that f zero is zero and f at l is zero. 
So we have a um, two-point boundary conditions. Now, if we put the boundary conditions together with the um, equation for f, we notice that we actually have an eigenvalue problem as follows. f double prime plus pf equals 0, and f0 is 0, and fl is 0. Here, the eigenvalues are p. Okay, previously we call it lambda, but you can call it by any symbol. And then um, this one here, we notice that it's one of the standard eigenvalue problems that we have studied, and um, we hopefully memorized it, so we can just spit out the solutions immediately. So um, here we know that P has to be um, positive, there are infinitely many of these eigenvalues. We call them Pn with an index equals um, omega n square, and omega n is n times pi over l. And then the function eigenfunction Fn will be a sine function, sine of omega n x, and uh, this holds for n equals all natural numbers. Okay, so here this omega here. Since this is a sine function, um, this omega will um, denote actually the um, frequency of the oscillation. And uh, um, usually the frequency is denoted by omega. Okay, so once we have solved for f, and now we seek solutions for g. We see that for each given index n and uh, each solution of fn, we can have a solution for g, and let's call it, eventually we'll call it gn. So this equation here will be satisfied by gn, the equation for g. g prime plus c square p, which is omega n square, g equals 0. So we notice that this is just a first order uh, constant coefficient linear ODE, where the solution is just the exponential function. Okay, so let's call this number here to be lambda n, which is c times omega n, which is n times pi c over l. And then we can write the equation for g, putting lambda n square as the constant. And then this uh, lambda n square is a positive constant. It will eventually be the rate of decay for the g as an exponential function. Okay, so we can write out the solution. gn will be an exponential function with the decay rate lambda n square times some arbitrary constant cn, which uh, so far we don't have any um, restriction on cn. So right now it's still arbitrary, but then will determine it. Okay, so this step, step four, we will try to form the solution. But before we do that, let's now collect what we have done so far. We see that now we have found a family of, uh, we call it eigenfunctions. They're actually also all solutions for the wave equation. For each index n, we can have a, a solution, let's call it un of xt, which is the product of the function gn times fn. If I fill in what we have for gn and fn, this is what we have. Okay, And then um, there are infinitely many of them. For each n equal um, 1, 2, 3 to infinity, there is a, such a function of un. So um, all of these uns, every one, each one of them is a solution to the 1D heat equation. Now comes another important step. So recall the principle of superposition, because this is a linear equation. Therefore, if you have many solutions, then the sum of all these solutions is also a solution. So this basically says we can sum up all these uns, and then the series will be a solution. OK. so then we call this a formal solution because there are issues related to this like convergence and all that so that's this is called formal so the formal solution u will be the sum of u n summing all up of all n let's put in the expression and that's what we have okay 
But in this sum so far, we have not put any restrictions on CNs, so they are still arbitrary. And let's identify these uh, constants. So Wn is n times pi over L, and then lambda is just uh, um, C times Wn, which takes this expression. So we now have a formal expression for the solution in terms of a series where the um, constant Cn is unknown. And next step, we'll have to determine the Cns. So we note that we have used the equation and we have used the two boundary conditions, but we have not used the initial conditions. So the initial condition is what we will use to find the constant Cns. Now let's fit in the initial condition u x t equals 0. If we put in the t equals 0 in the expression, then the exponential function becomes 1, and we just have that, and that shall equal to f of x. And now, um, does this look familiar, this equation here? This says the function f of x is expressed as a Fourier sine series, isn't it? on the interval from 0 to L. OK, so here is another extremely important revelation in this derivation here. We see that Cn here must be the Fourier sine coefficient for um, this function, but uh, for the um, odd periodic half range extension of fx. Okay, so all this we have discussed in the um, previous chapter. So um, now you understand why we discuss Fourier series separately before we started PDE discussion, because it's needed. All right, so pulling out that um, formula, so we know that Cn will equal 2 over L integral 1 to L, fx times this sign here, dx. Okay, so for a given fx, for a given n, one can work out this integral and get the coefficient cn. Here n will run from 1 to 3 and so on. Okay, so um, after all the derivation and so many important um, arguments we applied there, let's now um, Take a break and look back and summarize, pull out what we have derived so far. So we have considered the heat equation in one space dimension, ut equals c squared uxx, x between 0 and l, t bigger than 0, where we have um, boundary conditions at the two points fixed to be 0 for all t bigger than 0. And then we have initial conditions when t is 0, initial temperature distribution is given as f of x on the interval from 0 to L. And then the formal solution can be written as a kind of a Fourier series with each term having an exponential function combined with it. So u will be a sum a series n from 1 to infinity of cn e to the negative decay, this is the lambda n here, squared t, and sine of omega n x, okay? And where the cn here can be computed as an integral using the initial condition f in this way for n equal 1 to 3. All right, so um, we have an expression for the formal solution. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, in the next video, we will take some examples and explore um, some properties of this solution. Okay, so that's all for this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, I will see you next time.